Uh, there are just a few general themes that are the focus for this year, and one, of course, is surface replacement. That has a resurgence, and probably the leader of that resurgence is Derek McMahon, and Derek was really helpful to us in being willing to uh, operate in England. It'll be uh, sent here by satellite. Derek is going to, uh, as soon as his surgery is over, is going to get on a helicopter and go to the airport and fly over here and he'll be here tomorrow and, uh, and be able to participate in the panel on surface replacement. So go ahead, Eric. You, you've got the show now. Okay, thanks, Larry. This patient is lying on his right side with his to be operated on left hip uppermost. I've marked uh, the tip of the greater trochanter and the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter. And I've also marked the traditional posterior lateral approach that I used to do. In addition, I've uh, marked in the surgical approach skin wound that I'm going to use today. And this has been uh, developed by Todd Swanson in Nevada. The start point for this uh, incision is five centimeters down from the tip of the uh, greater trochanter, uh, lying on the uh, posterior aspect of the greater trochanter. And then if we angle back uh, 20 or 30 degrees and extend for 10 centimeters, that's Todd Swanson's standard incision. For resurfacing, we have to distally extend the incision a little bit uh, to allow exposure of the lesser trochanter. And the amount of distal extension very much depends on the size of the patient and the uh, amount of uh, fat present. Okay to go, Jonathan? Okay. So I'm making my incision 11 centimeters along that line. And I'm now going to deepen through the fat layer and then we'll put in a retractor and start coagulating vessels. I have uh, more problem with bleeding in the fat layer than I have in the deep layers, so I'm fairly careful about coagulating all small vessels. You can see the fibers of gluteus maximus being exposed and we're just clearing fat over the attachment area of the fibers of gluteus maximus onto the fascia lata. For a total hip replacement, of course, it's not important to extend the incision that extra centimeter or two distally because you have no need to get to the uh, lesser trochanter. I'm now cutting into the fascia lata and the fibers of uh, gluteus maximus are being separated. I try and open up the space between the greater trochanter bursa and the inner surface of the gluteus maximus muscle. This is the area, of course, where the sciatic nerve lies and on the way in I always palpate the sciatic nerve and know exactly what its position is in all patients. I'm just coagulating some vessels and soon we're going to be ready to take the small self-retaining retractor out and replace that with a Charney uh, retractor. to take care, of course, not to pick up the sciatic nerve with the posterior wing of this retractor. I'm 
are just completing now the separation of the gluteus maximus fibers in the proximal extent of the wound. And now we're ready to divide the tenderness insertion of gluteus maximus onto the femur distally. It is very important, I feel, to divide the gluteus maximum insertion because Chit Ranawat has shown that if you do not do this, then with turning of the leg, you can pinch the sciatic nerve underneath the tenderness insertion of maximus and get a sciatic nerve palsy. I'm now dividing the bursa at the back of the greater trochanter and exposing the abductors and the piriformis tendon. That retractor is now pulling forward the back edge of gluteus medius and that's exposing now the back edge of gluteus minimus and the piriformis tendon. I'm now cutting with electrocautery the gap between piriformis and the back edge of minimus. Now I'm going underneath the fibers of minimus, first with cautery, and then cutting the connecting fibers underneath minimus with scissors. And we can then retract forwards and proximally the back edge of the abductors exposing the ilium. I now put a pin into the ilium, holding the back edge of the abductors forwards. It's important to release underneath the abductors and no tearing of the abductor muscle occurs. I'm now cutting the piriformis tendon and the capsule tight to the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter. And the external rotators and capsule are taken off as one flap. There's always bleeding uh, at this point, and so I'm now going to use electrocautery to seal that bleeding. And then, by a mixture of uh, cutting with a knife and electrocautery, we cut the attachment of quadratus femoris to the back of the trochanter, leaving a cuff attached to the bone for final closure. It's important to try and leave soft tissue remaining on the femoral neck on the way in to make sure that we do not devascularize the femoral neck. So we try and stay away if we can from the surface of the femoral neck when doing our cutting. We've now got some bleeders to uh, seal, both on the back of the greater trochanter and in the muscle mass. The next and very important trick is to grasp the postero-inferior capsule and then make a postero-inferior capsular radial cut and this allows the whole flap of external rotators and capsule to come back and gives a much better exposure. I'm now getting on to the ischium and I'll put a pin into the ischium about a centimeter or a centimeter and a half away from the edge of the acetabulum making sure not to crack off the edge of the acetabulum. So that's our posterior exposure completed. Now we're cutting the superior joint capsule and now we're ready for dislocation. Dislocation is now occurring and the next procedure is to try and seal any remaining bleeding on the intertrochanteric crest. The next procedure is to extend and rotate the femur so that we can see the anterior capsule. And we leave the psoas tendon intact and there you can see with scissors 
I'm starting to cut from in fairly upwards the anterior hip capsule. That is important to be able to deliver the femoral head up into the wound and make the exposure easy. I complete the cut by cutting from above downwards in the anterior hip capsule and when those two cuts match up then the anterior capsulotomy is complete. Here you can see the area of uh, bare bone on this man's femoral head and you can hear the instrument on bone. I want you to notice at this stage as I start excising osteophyte from around the head neck junction that the first assistant keeps moving the limb to deliver the area that I want to work on on the femur into the field of view. If you have an assistant who acts like a statue, this makes life very difficult with a minimum exposure. So he keeps moving the femoral head around so that I can work on the femoral head and femoral neck. It's important to remove all osteophyte at this stage because you want to know where the neck is rather than neck plus osteophyte. So for our own records, we record the maximum neck diameter, the minimum neck diameter, the maximum head diameter, and the minimum head diameter in all patients. And this is uh, quite interesting. We've got uh, a thousand such records. And this man's maximum femoral head dimension happened to be 56 and we can tell you from the basis of our records that it's highly likely that I'll put in a 56 cup. Now the 54 femoral template clears the femoral neck with ease. The 50 template also clears the neck. There's plenty of substance in the femoral head to use either the 50 or the 54 component. So it will not be the femur that determines which size I use. It will be the acetabulum. If I use a 50 head, I can use a 56 or a 58 standard component. If I need a dysplasia, I will use a 58 dysplasia. If, however, the acetabulum needs a 60 or a 62, then a femoral component 54 will be chosen if a dysplasia is required, then a 62 will be chosen. Just a reminder for surgeons that the colors of the femoral component and the acetabular component must match. You must not put in a red head with a green cup. The color on the box of the femoral component must be the same color as on the box of the acetabular component. Now we've got to get the femoral head and neck out of the way to allow us to work on the acetabulum. With a hook we pull the femoral head and neck upwards and forwards and I'm going around the anterosuperior acetabular edge with scissors, cutting capsule, muscle and reflected head of rectus femoris, taking care to keep the scissor tip absolutely close to the bone. When this is completed, then we put a retractor in and drive the tip halfway between the edge of the acetabulum and the anterior inferior iliac spine. The leg is then rotated and you will be able to see the femoral head prolapsing under the abductor muscles. This allows the femoral head and neck to be displaced anterosuperiorly, gaining access to the acetabulum. The hip is flexed, and I'm using a sterile pillow on the nurse's tray to stop the leg falling off the front edge of the table. The second capsular cut I do is antero-inferior, because when the femoral head is displaced up and forwards, this makes the anterior capsule tight. So we cut the antero-inferior capsule over the position of the psoas. A 
tabular retractor is then inserted under the transverse acetabular ligament and the teardrop and that's hooked onto the charnley frame. A small retractor is put over the front of the acetabulum keeping close to bone and a second pin retractor is placed in the posterior column. We now have all the retraction required for the acetabular part of this procedure. First we are excising the labrum, the superior and posterior labrum are here being excised Then I'm excising the anterior labrum. And now I'm excising the remnant of the ligamentum teres. He has, as we saw on the pre-op x-ray, subluxation, and a lot of uh, buildup of osteophyte in his acetabular floor and he's got osteophyte on his posterior wall so I'm knocking off osteophyte here on the posterior acetabular wall and I'm clearing osteophyte formation in the floor of the acetabulum so that I can see clearly the true floor of the socket and that will be the medial extent of my reaming. I want to clear all that osteophyte out and I want to identify the teardrop before I start reaming. So a rondeur is being used to excise the acetabular osteophyte bone. Any remnants of transverse ligament is removed. Some posterior wall osteophyte is now being removed. I'm now going to coagulate uh, the acetabular vessels in the region of the teardrop. There you can see the acetabular teardrop, with coagulation of bleeding vessels, and now you can see the margins of the true acetabulum. We're starting here with a 45 millimeter acetabular reamer and first of all I'm aiming to sink that in to the true acetabular floor. We go up in two millimeter increments until we get resistance from the acetabular reamer indicating a final ream size. We're getting close to our final ream size now. And the minor dysplasia that this man had is not really a problem now. Because I've deepened the acetabulum, we've got plenty of anterosuperior support and we will not need a dysplasia socket. The trial socket, which is one millimeter smaller than the definitive, is now being inserted. And I'm now pointing out to you that we have adequate anterosuperior cover. And you can see we've also got plenty of posterior and anterior acetabular cover. You want that trial to move in the acetabulum because since it's one millimeter smaller than, than the definitive, we don't want that too tight because we must insert the acetabular component right into the true floor. Now we turn to uh, the acetabular component, which is a 56 millimeter component. I've reamed to 54 millimeters. Here it's being mounted on the introducer. The introducer is being tensioned and that tension is being taken in the cables, solidly fixing the implant onto the introducer. 
you can see the hydroxyapatite coated porous surface. Here's the anti-rotation flanges that go into the ischium and pubis. And I'm pointing out to you marks on the plastic which allow us to see the rotational position of the acetabular component when it's in. We're retracting soft tissue out of the way and then using a hammer to insert the acetabular component. We're lining it up so that we've got roughly 45 degrees of abduction and 20 degrees of adiversion. You can see I'm moving the introducer and that's moving the whole patient, indicating that we've got a good fix of this component in the patient's acetabulum. I now unwind the acetabular introducer and we retract the polyethylene impactor cap and this is our final opportunity to check our component position. If that's not satisfactory, then we change it before cutting the cables. However, it is satisfactory, so we've snipped the cables and we now pull out the impaction cap and the cut wires. Because it's in Birmingham, we throw polyethylene in the bin. I'm now excising any protruding osteophyte. Here I'm excising osteophyte along the posterior acetabular wall so that we do not get impingement. Now I'm excising anterior osteophyte and you've got to be careful with anterior osteophyte because if your rongeur is not sharp then the osteophyte can break off and leave the anterior wall of the component exposed and we do not want to do that because we want to leave a two millimeter fringe of bone covering the edge of the acetabular component to protect the psoas tendon and other anterior soft tissues from rubbing against exposed metal. So we want to remove enough osteophyte to prevent impingement but we don't want an exposed edge of acetabular component metal that can rub on the psoas tendon and give groin pain. Here I'm pointing out the fringe of bone that I've left proud of the anterior edge of the acetabular component. I like to irrigate the wound, clear out all debris and also uh, keep the rest of the wound moist. We'll then insert local anaesthetic and adrenaline and the regime I use is that from Sydney worked out by doctors Kerr and Cohan and we insert three lots of local anaesthetic which is ribivacaine and adrenaline the first lot of local is inserted after acetabular component insertion. We space them apart in the procedure because we do not want high levels of ribivacaine getting into the bloodstream. So that pretty well completes our acetabular component insertion. The keys are to be able to see the bony margins of the acetabulum and to get enough access to not have the component excessively open. Remember I'm shooting roughly for 45 degrees of inclination and 20 degrees of antiversion. Pins and retractors are now out and the femur is rotated to bring the femoral head, neck and intertrochanteric region into view. We're just slackening off the Charnley retractor and inserting now to expose the lesser trochanter and the intertrochanteric yeah, crest. 
you recall that I told you that we want to measure up from the lesser trochanter the measured templated distance. So we're using a ruler in this demonstration to show you the point that we want to mark on the intertrochanteric crest. The jig on the left is the jig that I've used for many years for the open procedure. The shortened jig on the right allows us to put a pin into the intertrochanteric crest and use this, a similar jig for the minimal incision procedure. A guide wire is bent and you can see the right angle part hooking over the lesser trochanter and a mark at the measured templated distance on the pin and we'll now make a, a mark with the electrocautery on the intertrochanteric crest and that's where I'm going to insert the pin for the guide. This pin is inserted through the open end of the guide and that gives us our varus valgus position. There is nothing that I can do now during this procedure that will alter that varus valgus alignment. You can see the femoral neck being demonstrated with two fingers and the varus valgus position is shown. The next thing we have to get right is the lateral plane alignment and we're now rotating around 90 degrees with our camera and we put a um, marker on the front and back of the femoral neck. I'm releasing the long arm of the jig so that we can alter the lateral plane alignment. We do not want the guide wire or the stem either up against the front or the back of the femoral neck. We want it down the middle of the femoral neck. Once I'm satisfied with the lateral plane alignment, we then tighten the nut on the long arm of the jig. So now I've got the varus valgus position and the lateral plane position correct. What I must decide now is where is my correct insertion point. So we've set this jig on 50 millimeters, which is the component size that matches the 56 millimeter cup that I've inserted and we keep altering the insertion point until the jig passes nicely around the femoral neck. When we're satisfied with the insertion point we tap the teeth in and then insert a guide wire down the cannulated rod. So that's three things I've got right. The fourth thing that I must get right is to make sure that I'm going to hit the periphery of the femoral head. So I want to miss the neck and not notch it, but at the same time I want to, the component to touch the femoral head. We can't have a gap between the component and the femoral head Otherwise, the cement will run out and we will lose our pressurization. We're now doing a final check. And sure enough, I've got clearance all around the neck. And in every position, the tip of the stylus hits the femoral head. I've slackened off the Charnley retractor and we retract inferiorly to expose the lesser trochanter. I'm now aiming that drill towards the center of the canal of the femur and into that hole is placed a cannula. Sturdy tubing is used to attach the cannula to a sucker which runs at minus 600 millimeters of mercury. Now we're packing off the uh, femoral neck region so that debris 
bone debris does not get splattered into the soft tissues of the hip. It is well worthwhile taking time to move the packing away from the femoral head because we do not want the teeth of the cutter instruments to catch on our packing. First we overdrill the guide wire. Sometimes this requires a lot of irrigation if the femoral head bone is very hard. We then insert the rod and now we're checking that our rod is in the desired position. This is checked with the use of the check jig. I'm now putting the head neck template around the femoral neck and this is to protect the superior neck in case I do a shoot through oops maneuver because I do not want to notch the superior femoral neck on such an inadvertent shoot through maneuver. This is an aggressive cutter and we cut part of the way through the periphery of the femoral head. We then crack off the superior bone and I'm going to check firstly that I am missing the superior femoral neck. So I'm just exciting bone and we'll show you in a minute the cut surface of the superior femoral head and the intact femoral neck distal to it. There's a view where you can see the superior cut head and the intact superior femoral neck distal to that. So I now, I now know that I can proceed with my peripheral cutting without damaging this man's superior femoral neck. So with care we finish off the peripheral cutting of the femoral head until the inferior bone will easily crack off. It's important not just to pull this bone off because that will strip soft tissue of the femoral neck. So we cut the bone soft tissue interface to maintain soft tissue on the femoral neck and the blood supply with it. Now we just go around the head neck junction trimming any further osteophyte present in that region. We remove our guide bar with a slap hammer Good. and now it's important to define how much are we going to cut off the top of the femoral head. And here I'm showing you soft tissue in the medial neck, cut surface of femoral head and the cortical medial head neck junction. We advance the sleeve ring to that cortical medial head neck junction. And that will mean that we're cutting off the correct amount of the head such that our Shenton's line and our leg length will be correct unless I've done something awful on the acetabular side, which as you've seen, I have not. Sleeve ring is now removed. Guide bar reinserted and we're ready to chamfer the femoral head. Now the femoral head is a mixture of hard sclerotic bone and soft cancellous bone. So we do the chamfering with the machine setting on drill 
so that if the cutter catches, then the machine will stop rather than break off the femoral head and neck. Now we're drilling some holes for keying of cement. This is our macro fixation. The micro fixation, of course, we will get from pressurization of low viscosity cement into the open cancellous network of the femoral head. There's a cyst being removed. There's another cyst beside it that also needs removal. So we have to carefully remove any cysts and then we'll open up the cancellous network of the femoral head with pulsed lavage and brushing. The femoral head does not bleed of course because with the amount of twist that we've got on the femur that will kink vessels and stop bleeding. The vent in the femur also prevents bleeding into the femoral head. To the left you can see fluid as I lavage coming out the suction vent. Having prepared the femoral head I'm now marking the position that the component has got to get to to be fully seated. So I've made my mark just distal to the medial head neck junction. So that mark should just be visible when the component is fully seated. I'm using low viscosity cement and we insert this cement early so we're shooting for a mix to insertion time of one minute. Of course we want low viscosity cement because this component is a tight fix on the periphery of the, fe of the femoral head in order to encourage high pressure injection of cement into the periphery of the femoral head and thus we will get good quality micro interlock and long lasting fixation. So we fill the body of the component up with low viscosity cement and then we're inserting the component at about 60 seconds. We push hard with the introducer and tap lightly with a hammer. You'll be able to see fat and marrow sucking out through our suction vent in a minute. I'm just clearing cement to make sure that I get my component fully seated. A millimeter short of the mark is no problem. Four millimeters short of the mark is a major problem because that would leave a lot of exposed cancellous bone on the base of the head and that's asking for an early fracture. So there's lots of fat coming out of the vent. Ending up in the suction bottle is the correct place for fat and marrow rather than being displaced into the general circulation. So now I've got my component fully seated and now we've got the downside of cement of clearing it all out and getting rid of all cement debris from the tissues and from the surface of the component. You can still see lots of fat and marrow pouring out of the femur. We've shown that this venting reduces markedly our incidence of fat embolization into the systemic circulation and we know this by checking with transesophageal echocardiography. I'm now removing any osteophyte at the periphery at the head neck junction. Again we need to take care not to remove soft tissue from the femoral neck because we do not want to devascularize that because that too is another 
potent cause, I believe, for femoral neck fracture. Now, some of you may ask, you've put the acetabular component in first, and I do that quite deliberately to ensure that the component I've put in does not lead to overreaming of the acetabulum. But what, say you, would you do if your femoral head turned out to be too soft for a resurfacing, or you made an error like bad notching of the femoral neck? The answer is, in my OR, I've got two femoral components for total hip replacement available, a cemented and a cementless. I use the CPCS cemented and the Synergy proximal porous and HA coated. And both of those stems are compatible with our modular heads and they will fit into all the Birmingham cups. I have had to remove uh, one Synergy stem for uncontrollable MRSA infection and, and this was at two months and there was fantastic boning growth into the proximal femur but having broken down the interface with osteotomes, thin osteotomes, I was then able to get the component out and you can see the details of the two month bone ingrowth and ongrowth into the proximal femur which greatly encouraged me. I've been a cemented femoral component addict for much of my career, but I'm now slowly transferring to cementless components now that I've found one that works well. I'm now doing a final uh, lavage with saline soaked swabs. And incidentally, you can see uh, saline uh, with fat and marrow that's been displaced into the femoral shaft being sucked out of our vent and into the suction bottle. So we want to get rid of all that displaced fat and marrow before letting the twist off the femur and the twist off the femoral vessels because then it will be in the general circulation. I'm now cleaning the acetabular component to make sure there's no retained bone debris or even worse cement there isn't I'm now going to fill up the acetabular component with saline and filling the acetabular component with saline has the effect that when the femoral head is reduced into it the splosh of saline takes any soft tissue out of the acetabulum and prevent soft tissue getting caught between the reduced femoral head and the acetabular component. We're now doing a range of movement check, a stability check, and an impingement check. And happily, all three in this man are entirely satisfactory. Our second dose of rupivacaine and adrenaline is now put into the external rotators, uh, capsule, and all other exposed and cut soft tissue. This is uh, a wonderful addition in my practice because it gives the patients at least 12 hours of totally pain-free following surgery. Without the disadvantage of sleepiness or sickness from opiate type drugs and without the disadvantage of urinary retention from spinal or epidural anesthesia. We put in a, a suction drain deep. And I'm now closing the external rotators and the capsule. There's the piriformis and the capsule being picked up by this loop PDS number one suture. 
will come from inside to out and then under the back edge of the abductors where it joins onto the greater trochanter. So that's the first stitch in our posterior closure. And yes, it's important to pick up muscle and capsule, particularly in the top end of the closure. My own feeling is that an extremely important aspect of this closure is for the second assistant not to pull too tight and strangulate tissue because then the repair will fall apart. As you move further down, more than two, two and a half centimeters, then only the quadratus femoris can be closed. The capsule is now too far away. And we're going down towards the tenderness insertion of Maximus, closing the remains of the posterior cut tissue. In the inferior aspect of the wound, it's very important not to accidentally pick up the sciatic nerve because the sciatic nerve gets very close at that point. And I take the tension off the Charnley retractor and I now close the greater trochanter bursa because these patients are athletes and they do not react well to greater trochanter discomfort. So I feel it's important to try and close all layers accurately. When we finish closure of that layer, again using PDS, we try and leave the suture ends long so that the spikes from the cut end of the sutures do not dig into the soft tissue. We do a final hemostasis check and there you can see that in this man the incision length is 11 centimeters. My colleague Mr. Pradhan is completing the closure. We put in a superficial drain and the third dose of local anesthetic and adrenaline is now being injected into the fat, muscle and skin. We use non-absorbable sutures for the uh, fascia lata and for the gluteus maximus muscle because we do not want a hernia in the fascia lata as this leads to marked muscle wasting around the hip. The important thing however with a non-absorbable suture is to make certain that the suture end is buried and here he's using a Miller's hitch and the knot will be buried in the soft tissue so that sitting in that region does not cause localized discomfort. It's vital to close the fat layer and nowadays we use clips to close the skin. I use a compression uh, stocking going right up over the hip region for six weeks to reduce post-operative swelling in the leg and hip region. And this patient will get up full weight bearing tomorrow. I do, however, encourage patients to use two elbow crutches, full weight bearing for one month and one stick in the opposite hand for a further month. Derek, I think that we're going to uh, leave you as you close. 
the uh, the technical skill you have is is just uh, clearly apparent, and uh, I think you probably made a lot of converts to uh, surface replacement. You sure made it look easy, and you sure made it look like it's a, a doable operation. So I, on behalf of all the audience, uh, I want to thank you so very much for uh, doing this. It was a uh, and and your whole team too. You obviously have a clearly a great team that works together very well. And so to all of you uh, from all of us, uh, thank you very much.